on the 24th of February, 2011, the quiet of the afternoon was suddenly shattered by the piercing wail of sirens. Neighbors emerged from their homes concerned as smoke began to billow from the windows of Jackie's childcare. Firefighters rushed towards the engulfing flames, attempting to extinguish the fire and rescue the nine children trapped inside the daycare. How many were inside? Nine people are still alive. All right. All right. Got nine people. Oh, two came out. They are coming straight. She said, "That's more inside." However, it was too late. Tragically, four children lost their lives and two more were severely burned and injured. How had the fire started? Where was Jessica Tata, the owner of the daycare? And how did this tragedy occur under the supervision of the person who had been trusted to watch over the children? On the 24th of February, 2011, everything seemed normal as parents dropped off their children at Jackie's Childcare, a small home-based facility nestled in a quiet neighborhood of Houston, Texas. Jessica Tata, the operator of the daycare, was watching the children, but decided to step out and visit the nearby Target store to purchase a few items. As she left the house, leaving nine children unsupervised, in a grave oversight, she also left a pan of grease cooking on the stove in the kitchen. While Jessica was captured by surveillance cameras shopping at the store, the oil in the pan ignited on the stovetop burner back at the daycare. When she returned to her home on Crest Park, near Way Park, shortly before 1.30 p.m., Jessica found the house ablaze with smoke pouring out. Upon seeing the smoke, she attempted to rescue the children inside. She managed to pull out two before the flames and smoke intensified, making further rescue attempts impossible. In a state of panic, she made a chilling call to 911 to report the fire, saying, 2810 Crest Park, I can't see anything. I can't even go in there and get them. They're dying. When firefighters arrived at the scene, the house was completely engulfed in flames. They promptly opened the roof to allow the smoke to escape. They tried to help them as far as I saw and then they took him out on the ambulance. So those seven kids, did, did they appear okay? Were they working on him? They were all working on him as hard as they could. Sadly, however, it was too late for some. Elias Xavier Castillo, 16 months. Shamari Leon Dickerson, three years. Elizabeth Cajo, 20 months. And Kendall Stradford, 20 months, all died in the fire. And three other children sustained serious injuries. Jessica initially claimed that she was in the restroom at the time the fire started. I don't know, oh, but mercy. I'm gonna lie, I don't know. Help, mercy. what happened? It was a fire. Where, how? Kitchen. I came out, all I did was pee. I came out, there was black everywhere. It was funny, I went straight for the kids. I couldn't see anything. I'm so sorry, I don't know what to do. However, upon closer inspection, Houston Fire Department investigator Dee Green found no physical evidence such as soot on her clothing or any injuries to indicate that she had been inside the house during the fire. Subsequently, investigators uncovered surveillance video from a Target store located approximately three minutes from the daycare, showing Jessica shopping at the Target at the time the fire started. This evidence heightened their suspicion regarding Jessica's actions and lies in her story. However, before further questioning could take place, Jessica had to be taken to the hospital. Houston Fire Department spokesman Patrick Trahan said, Arson investigators are rounding up information and they want an opportunity to speak with the caregiver. The caregiver was hospitalized yesterday. They made attempts to talk with her, but they would like to have an opportunity to sit down and have a full conversation with her about what occurred yesterday. At the hospital, investigators attempted to speak with Jessica to obtain a statement. However, they encountered resistance from Jessica's family, who were described as uncooperative. Testimonies revealed that her brother felt as though Houston Fire Department investigator Dee Green was merely harassing them to secure a statement. Jessica claimed to the investigators that she was in shock, unsure why she was in the hospital, 
and confused about the questions being asked by the investigators. Do you wish to give us a statement today? I'm still in shock. I don't remember anything. Okay. All right. Well, do you wish to make a statement at this time? I don't remember anything. You don't remember anything about what happened today? I don't anything. Despite her claims, the investigators did not believe she was genuinely in shock and suspected that she was being deceptive. When the investigators tried to speak with her again after she was discharged from the hospital, they discovered that Jessica had fled to Nigeria. Investigators learned from speaking with the family that they had friends and relatives in Nigeria and that they made annual trips to the country this information provided a possible link to Jessica's whereabouts. Ms. Tata is believed to have flown to Nigeria just before the state of Texas filed criminal charges. The FBI, U.S. Marshal Service, and now reportedly Interpol are all involved in tracking down Ms. Tata. The authorities believe that Ms. Tata is in Nigeria, perhaps near the oil city of Port Harcourt. The practical effect of a red notice filing is that Ms. Tata will be landlocked uh, if she attempts to travel from Nigeria to another country, for example, and if she goes through immigration and customs and her name is run, then the red notice is going to pop up and she'll be arrested in that country and placed in extradition proceedings between the country she attempted to enter and the United States. Subsequently, Jessica Tata became one of the U.S. Marshal's 15 most wanted fugitives and remained on the run for more than 20 days. With the assistance of Interpol and agents from the State Department, she was finally located and apprehended in Port Harcourt, Nigeria on the 19th of March, 2011. Jessica Tata was charged with four counts of felony murder, in addition to charges of abandoning a child and reckless injury to a child, and she pleaded not guilty to these initial charges. Jessica Tata's trial began on October 24th, initially focusing solely on the murder charge connected to the death of 16-month-old Elias Castillo. While there was no intent to kill the child, under Texas law, a person can be convicted of murder if they commit an underlying offense that subsequently leads to a death. The prosecution did not need to prove that Jessica intended to harm the children. Rather, they needed to demonstrate that the deaths occurred because she placed the children in danger by leaving them unsupervised. This falls under the category of felony murder in Texas law, where someone can be convicted if they commit an underlying felony that causes a death. Prosecutors portrayed Jessica as an irresponsible daycare owner who had not only repeatedly left the children alone, but also operated an unclean facility. Prosecutor Steve Baldassano said, she was being paid to watch these children. She knew better, it's nobody's fault but her own. During the trial, Prosecutors called several witnesses to strengthen their case against Jessica. A seven-year-old girl testified that Jessica once left sleeping children by themselves at her daycare while she went to get takeout food. An expert testified that the stove in the daycare had been left on and a state investigator presented evidence that Jessica had admitted to leaving a pan on the stove. Furthermore, surveillance footage showed her shopping at Target just before the fire broke out. A former Target manager testified that Jessica did not appear to be in a hurry or concerned after realizing she had left the stove on while the children were at the daycare. She was in the building for maybe five to ten minutes and she was in no hurry to leave the building at all. She didn't tell us directly that she went to the grocery store, but we could see like grocery bags and like drinks right there at the front of the door. Neighbors provided emotional testimony recounting that they heard the children crying as they made desperate but unsuccessful attempts to rescue them from the engulfing flames. To illustrate the severity of the situation, jurors were shown photographs of the injuries suffered by two of the three children who survived. The photos depicted 22-month-old Dajon Ashley, who sustained burns covering 22% of his body, and two-year-old Michaela Dickerson, who suffered burns on 15% of her body. Both children had undergone multiple surgeries to treat their severe injuries. During the trial, parents of the children, who were either injured or died in the fire, expressed to the jurors that they had placed their trust in Jessica, believing she was a qualified caregiver. However, a shocking revelation emerged in court. 
that further complicated Jessica's defence. It was disclosed that when Jessica applied for her home daycare licence, she failed to mention that she had previously pleaded no contest to an arson charge as a juvenile in 2003. This charge was related to two separate fires that occurred on the same day in bathrooms at her Houston high school. This past incident raised serious concerns about her judgement and character, influencing the jury's perception of her culpability in the daycare fire. Susan Lamaya, a former district director of licensing at the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, told jurors, if we had had that information, that would have prevented the agency from issuing a license. A history like that elevates the concern about taking care of children. She carried on by saying that her agency does conduct background checks on all applicants. Unfortunately, this check did not reveal Jessica's criminal history. The official expressed uncertainty about Waitata's criminal past had not been detected. Jessica's attorney, Mike DeGurin, presented a defence suggesting that Jessica might have been under the impression that her juvenile criminal history was confidential. He argued that this misunderstanding could have led her to believe that she was not required to disclose this information on the daycare licensing application. In the juvenile system, a defendant typically does not enter a guilty plea, but rather a plea of true to charges of delinquent conduct. Jessica had entered a plea of true to the charge of arson and had been sentenced to probation. Her attorney's argument aimed to highlight the possibility that Jessica's misunderstanding of the application's questions about her criminal history could have been genuine rather than an attempt to deceive. During the trial, Lisa Hayes, an arson investigator with the Houston Fire Department who had previously taught a fire prevention class that Jessica attended as part of her probation for the arson case in 2003 provided compelling testimony. She told jurors that during the course, Jessica displayed a concerning lack of empathy or concern for the potential harm her actions could have caused. According to Lisa Hayes, Jessica explicitly expressed indifference about the possibility of injuring others due to her actions. Lisa Hayes quoted Jessica, saying she didn't care about hurting other people. Additional testimony in the trial highlighted Jessica's troubling behaviour during her high school years, reinforcing concerns about her character. Sandra Wilson, an assistant principal at the high school Jessica attended following her arson case, shared her experiences with the court. Sandra Wilson testified that she had to discipline Jessica on multiple occasions, including an incident involving forged grades. She described Jessica as having a presence about her that was very intimidating to other people. Sandra Wilson further recounted a particularly alarming episode where Jessica attempted to follow her home from school one evening after being disciplined. She said, I didn't want her to know where I live. I was shook up. According to another witness, Jessica was reprimanded on five additional occasions, including two instances of theft and one each for trespassing disruptive activity and assault. This pattern of behaviour painted a picture of a person with a history of defiance and disregard for rules and the well-being of others, elements that were critical for the jury's understanding of her character and the nature of the daycare fire incident. The defence presented a starkly different view of Jessica arguing that she never intended to harm the children and had indeed tried to rescue them during the fire. Her lawyers characterised the incident as a tragic mistake rather than a deliberate act of harm. Defence attorney Mike DeGurin asserted that Jessica should not have been tried for murder as he believed the deaths were accidental and not a result of intentional malice. To support their argument, Jessica's family and friends testified portraying her as a compassionate individual who deeply loved children. They appealed to the jury for leniency, highlighting her character and her efforts during the crisis. Jessica's brother specifically noted that she managed to carry two children out of the burning home and attempted to return to save more, but was overwhelmed by the smoke and flames. These testimonies aimed to show Jessica as a dedicated caregiver who found herself in a disastrous situation, underscoring the defence's argument that while the outcome was horrific, it was not a result of a deliberate or negligent disregard for the safety of the children in her care. 
the defence also introduced expert testimony to suggest that the cause of the fire might have been faulty kitchen equipment rather than negligence on Jessica's part. Their sole defence witness, an engineering expert, testified that he believed the stove was off at the time of the fire. He proposed an alternative theory, suggesting that a malfunction in the refrigerator could have sparked the blaze. Additionally, he discussed potential issues with the stove, noting that the Electrolux range model in question had a history of complaints, including incidents where it unexpectedly switched from low to high heat or turned on by itself. Despite these arguments, the jury ultimately was not convinced by the defence's claim that a malfunctioning appliance was to blame for the tragedy. After deliberation, they found Jessica Tartar guilty of felony murder in the death of Elias Xavier Castillo, rejecting the possibility that the incident was an accidental fire caused by faulty equipment. In 2012, during the punishment phase of Jessica's trial, prosecutors pushed for the maximum sentence, emphasising the severity of her actions. The potential punishment ranged from five years to life in prison. At the sentencing hearing, held in a Houston courtroom, the great-grandmother of Elias Castillo, who died at the age of 16 months, addressed Jessica directly. While holding Jessica accountable for the tragedy, she expressed her forgiveness. She said, Nobody wins in this situation. My heart goes out to the Tata family and those precious mothers and fathers who lost their babies. His grandmother, on the other hand, said, she deserves life in prison, so she doesn't do any more harm. During the closing arguments of the punishment phase, Jessica's attorney emphasized that the fire and subsequent deaths were accidental. He argued that Jessica made a terrible mistake, but never intended for the children to be harmed because she loved them. He urged the jury to consider that Jessica had no malicious intent and that the tragedy was the result of a lapse in judgment rather than deliberate negligence. He said, she should have called for help or she should have said to herself, I'll wait until they wake up, change their diapers, I'll load them up in the car and we'll go to Target together, but she didn't. She thought, they'll be fine, I'll be back in 20 to 30 minutes and they'll be fine. That is where she was wrong and that is where she's going to live with that decision for the rest of her life. She mourns for those children. He argued that Jessica would pay the price forever, regardless of how long she spent in prison due to her poor judgment. He urged the jury not to let emotions dictate their decision on the length of Jessica's prison sentence, emphasizing that the tragedy was not the result of malicious intent. Instead, he implored them to recognize it as a lapse in judgment that would haunt her for life. However, Assistant District Attorney Connie Spence argued during the closing arguments that evidence showed Jessica had left the children home alone on previous occasions. Connie Spence asserted that Jessica consistently put her personal desires ahead of the well-being of the children in her care. This behavior, Connie Spence emphasized, demonstrated a pattern of negligence and disregard for the children's safety. She said, if that was the first time she had ever left those babies alone, she would be in a hurry. She would be panicked, thinking, okay, I need to get home, I need to get home. She made her life the priority, not those babies. She was going to do what she needed to do and work around the babies. What we want is justice, not vengeance. What's a child's life worth? How can you put a number on a child's life? They will never be back, and what could have been will never be. During an emotional closing argument, prosecutor Connie Spence showed the jury a video of the children playing together not long before the fire. She added, we as human beings look forward in life, and they've been looking at Jessica Tata for the last four weeks, and they can humanize her. Because we are human and because we look to the future, we tend to forget the past too quickly, particularly when all you have left is a flat piece of paper. Jurors then heard from several witnesses including Jessica's sister and the mothers of the victims. Jessica's sister testified that her sister was devastated following the fire. Elias Castillo's mother, Keisha Brown, also took the stand. She chuckled softly as she described her son as a happy baby who always seemed to be smiling. However, tears began to flow as she recounted 
how she learned her son had been injured in the fire at the daycare and how she held onto the hope that he would pull through, but he tragically passed away the next day. She said, can't nobody say a single word and make you feel better because your heart is breaking. Jurors deliberated for seven hours over two days before finally reaching a decision. Ultimately, 24-year-old Jessica Tata was sentenced to 80 years in prison for the death of Elias Castillo. As the punishment was announced, Jessica showed no visible reaction. In addition to the prison sentence, she was ordered to pay a $10,000 fine. Ms. Tata, please stand. Verdict. We, the jury, having found the defendant, Jessica Tata, guilty of felony murder, assess her punishment at confinement in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for 80 years and assess a fine in the amount of $10,000. Initially, Jessica was scheduled to face three other counts of murder, three counts of abandoning a child, and two counts of reckless injury to a child. However, the judge decided to drop the remaining eight cases against her. The district attorney's office retained the option to refile the murder charges at a later time, but felt it was in the best interest of the families for Jessica to begin serving her prison sentence immediately. Steve Baldassano with the Harris County District Attorney's Office said, she's not eligible for parole for another 30 years, so there's no point in dragging the families through another trial for no gain if she's going to be in prison. Despite only being sentenced for the death of one of the children, during the trial, jurors heard about the deaths and injuries of all of the preschoolers. He carried on by saying, they heard about all of the kids, all seven were mentioned from beginning to end. I think the 80-year sentence reflected that. We want to make sure the message goes out clear, and I think the jury felt this way, that if any daycare worker, or anybody dealing with the elderly, that they pay attention, and they look at this verdict, and it changes the way they do things. He said there was no way to stack additional sentences on top of the 80-year punishment, so any more trials would be redundant. He said, there's really no reason to drag the families through all of that again. They pretty much understand there's no point in going through that again for nothing. She's already doing the time. Elias Castillo's grandmother expressed relief when the trial concluded, but affirmed that she and her daughter, Keisha Brown, would willingly take the witness stand again if another family chose to pursue legal action against Jessica in court. Despite the emotional toll, they were prepared to support other families seeking justice. She said, I know there's justice for the other babies because she's going to jail, but I don't know how I'd feel if I was one of the other families in not going to trial for my child. She said the families were disappointed to learn that any prison sentence of 60 years or more including a life sentence, means the defendant is eligible for parole in 30 years. She said, everyone wanted to see her get life. We wanted life without parole. Life without parole is only available for capital murder, which requires prosecutors to prove to a jury that the defendant intended to kill. Despite the family's desire for life without parole, they were still grateful for the sentence Jessica received. Elias Castillo's aunt, Nancy Villanueva expressed her gratitude, saying, All I want to say is thank you for everybody that's been keeping up with everything, and from the bottom of our hearts, we're thankful for today's verdict, and we're happy, and that's all I have to say. As of today, Jessica Tata remains in prison. She is eligible for parole in March 2031, but her projected release date is March 2091. firefighters who responded to the scene still have nightmares about what they witnessed that day and they continue to struggle with the emotional pain. When the dispatch dropped, it said uh, daycare center on fire report of people trapped. That's one of the ones that really bother you and you're hoping it's not true when you get there, right? So it's almost like one of those nightmarish scenarios that come true that you don't want to. So uh, en route, uh, it was no shortage of help and urgency because any available ambulance supervisor or transport unit wanted to be added to that run record. These brave men and women put their lives on the line daily to protect others, often placing themselves in dangerous situations to rescue those in need. So we went to work and like your mind, just like, you're like kind of out of body experience. I mean, we're trained to do it, 
but you rely on the training at that point. Like I knew what I needed to do, get what I needed to get done. But the human part, like I was crying, it was like, I looked up and he was, you know, doing CPR on a woman and the other guys were just like, it's like drop me in the middle of the twilight. It's easy to overlook the immense risks they face and the extremely difficult and harrowing circumstances they endure. From battling fires to administering first aid under pressure, their work requires both physical strength and emotional resilience, and we owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude for their commitment and sacrifice. Yeah, it's definitely a, a, a feeling in your gut, you know, that you get, uh, that you want to do your best work that day. Um, it, was, it was pretty good, Rich. In 2018, KPRC2 spoke with Tiffany Dickerson, the mother of two children who were in the house that tragic day. Sadly, her three-year-old son, Shamari, did not survive, but her two-year-old daughter, Michaela, managed to escape, despite being severely burnt. Firefighters said that it was clear three-year-old Shamari had tried to take the burning pot off the stove to try and save the children, as he had the most severe burns. When he realized it was too late, he heroically covered his little sister, Michaela, with his own body and saved her life. It was nap time, but everybody was in a fire. They were trying to escape, the kids, but well, me and my brother, we couldn't escape. So he just got on top of me, protecting me, and he was a really good hero. Reflecting on that day, Tiffany Dickerson recounted seeing her daughter. She said, I pulled back the sheet and she looked like a peeled lobster. All I saw was flesh. I was just thinking to myself, I don't know how they're going to be able to save her legs. Michaela was rushed to Shriners Hospital in Galveston, where the medical team worked on her and saved her life. Michaela has undergone 13 surgeries and will need more as she continues to grow. She caused me a miracle. She says I'm a miracle baby and I'm a survivor. I always wonder what it'd be like to be normal. Like, if my brother survived, right. if I was never in the fire, that I wouldn't meet, like, Shriners Hospital or the, or the really nice nurses and doctors. Sadly, despite her challenging childhood, Michaela continues to face adversity, having been bullied by children who don't know her story. I just still have to put on a good face because I have to show the bullies that they can't push me around, mm -hmm. but they can't make me feel bad, and I have to, have to show them that they can't ruin my day. Yet, even after all she's endured, Michaela remains determined to help other children who may look or feel different. You have to embrace the fire part of you because whether you like it or not, it's going to be who you are. And don't let other people stop you from believing because you're beautiful just the way you are. I had one dream that I had a dream for very long to be an actress, but my other dream this time was that I was going to be sharing my story to the burnt people. Little Michaela's strength is genuinely inspiring, and it's clear she has grown into an incredible person. Her courageous recovery and her willingness to share her story inspire hope and resilience in the face of adversity. Following the fire, the city of Houston aimed to enhance the protection of children in home daycares. The city council passed an ordinance requiring home daycares to pay a $100 inspection fee and undergo annual inspections by the Houston Fire Department. Jessica's daycare, like all home daycares, was already inspected by the state. However, the new city ordinance ensures that within city limits, another set of eyes will be monitoring home daycares. The new ordinance requires the fire department to check for fire code violations such as smoke detectors and clearly marked exits. While it's unclear if these measures would have prevented the fire at Jessica's daycare, the city hopes that this additional oversight will help prevent future tragedies. The Houston City Council member Sue Lovell said, If we can do anything to make children safer, then that's what we can do in City Council, and I believe that's what we're doing. This case is truly heartbreaking. Whatever your thoughts on Jessica Tartar's punishment, whether you believe it was just or think it should have been more lenient, there are no winners here. Four children lost their lives, and two more were severely injured. While nothing can bring back the lives lost or erase the scars left on families, this tragedy has united the community in its resolve to prevent future heartbreak. By sharing their stories and supporting one another, these families remind us that even in the darkest times, hope can emerge. 
leading to meaningful change. As always, my heart goes out to the friends and family of the victims, and rest in peace, Elias Xavier Castillo, Shamari Dickerson, Elizabeth Cajo, and Kendall Stradford. Why would you leave your own, your own class alone? How can you live with that if you're watching this today? How can you leave someone to die? Do you think she thinks about that? Probably she has to think with that guilt for the rest of her life.